Hello, everyone. Welcome to our webinar on visualization and graphics. My name is Julian Paris, and I'll be your presenter today. Uh, we have a chat and Q&A panel that you can use to ask questions during our webinar. And uh, if you just type your questions in there, I'll see them as we go along. And I have a couple stopping places, and so I'll make sure to get to your questions. So I'm going to go ahead and uh, share my desktop. Give this a second. And uh, as my desktop popped out, pops up, you'll notice you actually have the option to make it full screen. Uh, that'll help, especially if you have a smaller monitor and uh, you want to see some of the details of what I'm doing. So today's webinar is on visualization and graphics and jump. And I'm expecting that you've probably seen uh, one or two maybe of our webinars before, or you're uh, already a jump user and you know a little bit about the basics of jump. Um, before jumping into the topics, I'll, I'll certainly give you maybe a two second sort of summary or review if you've never seen jump before, just so you can, of course, follow along. Uh, but the main purpose of today's webinar is to talk about um, a couple of places in Jump that are, are specifically dedicated to creating visualizations. And if you used Jump before, and I'll just pull up in a, a data set here, um, anytime you produce output in Jump, it's really a, an ethos of Jump to always produce some kind of graphic. So even if we're working in the Analyze menu and say we get a, a you know, distribution output, uh, we're always going to get some kind of graphic to accompany the statistics that we have. Uh, but today's webinar is much more focused on, on creating graphics purposefully. You know, there's this distinction between exploratory data analysis, which is something Jump uh, certainly is very good at, and explanatory data analysis and data visualization. Uh, certainly what you're doing once you've decided what the story in your data is, and you want to communicate that story to others. And so that's really the purpose of today's webinar. Uh, and we're going to use extensively a graph builder, something I hope you've seen before. And that's really the place in Jump when you're creating these graphics with the purpose of, of showing data to other people. And so you've already sort of figured out what is meaningful in your data and you want to communicate it. Now, if you've never seen Jump before, there's just a few things, of course, you need to know about. Uh, Jump, once you get data in, which is as simple as file open, uh, Jump is very specific about how your data is modeled. And the modeling type of the data, that's these little icons here. If I click on one, you can see the modeling type selections. The modeling type is really what a variable means to Jump. And so if you have something like in this data set, these are about Hollywood movies, uh, the little blue triangle is a continuous modeling type. We're telling Jump that those numbers actually mean something numeric and something on a scale. Uh, now, of course, numbers don't always have to mean something numeric or something on a scale. Sometimes we collect data with ones and twos to represent male and female. And so those would actually be modeled as a nominal modeling type. We'd have to tell jump this. And so as we go through uh, Graph Builder, you'll see that Graph Builder, sort of the graphing engine we're going to use today, is going to pay attention to the modeling type. So if you've never seen Jump before, just be aware that when you bring your data in, these little icons, the thing you set over here, will have consequences for the type of visuals and types of options Jump will give you. Now beyond that, using Jump is actually pretty straightforward. Jump has some, some certain tricks and things that you'll learn as you go along, uh, but once you get that under your belt, uh, there's not much more you really need to know. All right, so I'm going to be using uh, Jump 13 for this demo. This is actually the first time I've given this webinar with our brand new version, which was just released last week. Uh, there are a few options in Jump 13, and I'll point them out that are new, uh, but pretty much everything I'm going to show you is fine with even earlier versions of Jump. Now, I'll be using sample data extensively, and the journal that accompanies this webinar, and I'll post it on our, our academic community afterwards, uh, I'll have links directly to the sample data. But if you've never used Jump before, or if you've never found the sample data before, uh, I want to point it out. It's under the Help menu and it's under sample data. And so if you want to follow along with this webinar later, uh, certainly go and grab those data sets and uh, you too can, can create these visuals. All right, so let me tell you a little bit about uh, this following hour. I'm going to talk about what I'll call Graph Builder basics, uh, which means going over the drop zones of Graph Builder, uh, how to work with the controls, how to create different types of graph, how to control those graphs, and some special tips that I think are useful when you're creating these visuals. So things about creating new variables, uh, how to create custom error bars, something that we have to do sometimes for publications, and uh, special types of table operations that allow you to do certain things in Graph Builder that maybe aren't totally obvious, but once you know how to do, uh, really opens the door to a lot of different things. Then I'm going to talk a little bit about graph customizations, so things we do right before we're ready to maybe export them out for a paper, or we really want to embellish the graph in a way that communicates the meaning a little more clearly. So things like setting axis customizations, changing fonts, uh, changing the orientation of labels, uh, how to uh, add reference lines and areas to highlight particular points of the graph or meaningful points along an axis. 
and then working with gradients. And this applies specifically when we're working with color themes or with heat maps. And so how to choose appropriate color themes and some sort of best practices there. And working with the scale types. There are times when uh, a linear scale for a gradient doesn't actually convey the meaning in the data as clearly as we would like. So I'll show you how to work with those. I certainly want to talk about sharing. You know, this is explanatory visualization, which means that you have an audience you're intending to communicate these data to. And so sharing your graph is very important. And I'll talk about uh, some neat things you can do with dashboards. So if you want to combine different graphs uh, and also just some basic saving and exporting. So exporting to files that are really high, high resolution. So for publication quality graphics uh, and also ways to export for the web. And so if you need to communicate these and you want to put your graphs on a website, uh, there's some great ways in Jump you can do that. At the end, I'm going to point you to some more resources and take you to the Jump Academic Community so you can actually see where to get this webinar later if you want to watch it and also to see some of the other resources we have. All right, so with that, let's actually jump right in. And I'm going to be talking again about Graph Builder today, which is under the Graph menu. And I'm going to launch Graph Builder uh, just so we have this palette over here to work with. And I want to orient you to Graph Builder if you've never seen it before. And Graph Builder works as an interactive graphing engine which means you can simply drag and drop variables around. Uh, now it's instructive to note that there is a dialogue option and sometimes this will be useful if you want to specify all the different roles and operations uh, in a dialogue. Uh, but the nice thing about Graph Builder is when we launch it, we don't actually get met with that dialogue. We get met with a palette and a drop zone uh, sort of selections that allow us to drag and drop our variables to create the visual. And so it always helps to have some sort of imagination of what you're trying to create uh, if you're trying to create a specific graphic because then you just move the variables into those particular roles. So let's take a look at the drop zones because there's there's drop zones for different types of operations and there let's start with the actually data drop zones. So these are drop zones like the Y and the X that are really there to accept uh, and to sort of map onto what data you're trying to visualize. So let's just start with an, uh, sort of a question. Do we think that in these Hollywood movies, this is just a sample of them, uh, that Rotten Tomato scores uh, are really uh, agreeing with the audience scores? So this is as simple as dragging a variable. And notice when I start dragging, the drop zones that can accept this variable are highlighted. Uh, so let's actually put this on the x-axis. Let's say that's what we want to predict from. Now, before I do anything else, let's, let's look at what Graph Builder did. As soon as I move the variable into a role, it'll show me a preview of what that graph will look like. Now, this actually turns out to be quite useful. So when I drag audience score over to the Y, even before I drop it, it's going to show me that visual. And as we move along today, you'll notice that this is a helpful thing when we're trying to decide what visual makes the most sense because we can try out several rather quickly. So let me drop it here. And notice that we're met with sort of a basic graph. We have a scatter plot, and Jump has added on what's called a smoother. And so if we look along the top, you'll see the two different sort of graph elements that are being plotted for us. All right, so those are the data roles. But we have some other drop zones that are useful for other types of things. So we have options that are really, or roles that are really about splitting or trellising this plot. And that's the group for X, the group for Y, and the wrapping roles. Now those are roles that are meant to break apart whatever data you're seeing already into the levels of another variable. Now levels can mean a number of different things depending on if you're working with a continuous variable or a categorical variable. Let's start with something simple like genre. And so I'm gonna grab genre. I'm gonna hover it over group for X. I'm not gonna drop it there because I, I quite dislike that visual. There's so many levels for genre that the breaking apart or the splitting of the plot here kind of hides the meaning. Let's go to group for Y and see if that does any better. Well, that's, that's a little better potentially. Maybe if we make our graph bigger, that'll work. But let's try one more, the trellis roll, the wrap. And this is one I really like, especially when you have many levels of a variable. And actually just for our own purposes, I'm gonna make this graph a little bit bigger. When you wrap a variable, this goes from left to right and up and down, of course, which allows you to see, remember that internal piece, the Rotten Tomatoes score is plotted against the audience scores, but now for the different genres. And so these splitting and trellising roles, and if I drag this out, you can see we can look at them again, group for X, group for Y, and wrapping. These roles allow you to break apart whatever internal visual you have across the levels of another variable. Now, genre is, of course, a categorical variable. It has levels. But what if we use a continuous variable in one of these trellising or splitting roles? So let's look at domestic gross. Do we think this relationship is the same across really the levels or the range of domestic gross? So let's see what happens. 
when I go and drop it in the group for uh, X roll, notice that what jump has done is bend in sort of equal intervals the different domestic gross uh, dollars. And so we're looking at this relationship now across five distinct levels of domestic gross. Uh, we'll talk a little bit more about this later. If you right click, and this is true in jump pretty much everywhere, always right click to get more options. There's an option to specify the number of levels. Maybe I just want to do this in a binary split. So I'll say two levels of domestic gross, the low domestic gross and the high domestic gross. Notice now that I can create that sort of split uh, looking at those two. Now I'm going to grab domestic gross. Let's look at it for wrapping. Wrapping, when we have two levels, does sort of the same thing. So I'm going to right click, do number of levels, and I'll do four, since we'll be able to now make this a little more clear why it's doing a wrap. Or if we drag it down to the group for Y, notice those same four. So when you drag variables around, and this is something true about Graph Builder in general, try different roles out to see what is conveying the story that you're trying to convey. All right, so that's the splitting and trellising rule. And I'm going to go through all of these, and then we'll sort of break apart and look at different graphs to uh, see how to apply these. Uh, overlay roles are sort of a different idea. So splitting is breaking apart what's happening here into separate sections. Overlay is, as it sounds, going to overlay the levels of whatever variable we specify into the single plot. So let's try again with theme. Remember, we had a lot of levels for theme. I'm going to drag that into overlay. Notice what it's going to do is instead of having those broken apart like we did before, it's instead going to, on the same plot, actually show all the different points and try to apply whatever visual we have selected, in this case that's smoother, across the different levels. Now that's actually a pretty uh, complicated graphic. I don't think we're extracting much meaning. Of course, with some of the interactivity of Jump, it's a little helpful. We can click on the different themes and see their traces. And so that actually is quite valuable. And even when we get to exporting this out to the web, uh, it'll maintain this interactivity. So this isn't a bad visual, but I don't think it conveys the story in a particularly forceful way. But that's what overlay will do. Overlay will plot whatever you're seeing in the same center piece. And we can combine this with other things. We can have the overlay, and then let's take back the, uh, the domestic gross, and let me drop that into a wrap. And notice we can now combine the idea of an overlay and a trellis. And so we can again look at, across the different levels of domestic gross, the overlaying themes between Rotten Tomato scores and audience scores. So a lot of stuff happening right there, uh, and I don't know if I would recommend that for most visuals. So I'm going to click undo a couple times to get back to where we were. And let me take out the overlay. So now back to the standard. So that's what overlay is, and we'll play with that, and there's some customizations we can apply with overlaying uh, depending on what type of variables we've specified. Now, color and size, now these roles are especially useful when you're showing points, because what these will do is, as the names imply, color or size the points based on something else. So let's take genre this time, and I'm going to take genre over, drop it into color, and notice what you'll do is you'll get a legend now on the right-hand side, which shows the different colors for the different types of movies. And again, these are, are still interactive, so we can click through. Now again, everything is behind a right-click. If I want to change the color of fantasy, let me right-click, I can change it to something else, maybe black. Or maybe I want to give it a special type of marker. I can right-click, go to marker, and give it something maybe a bigger or different. So in this case, let's actually give it a, uh, a little triangle. And so sometimes when you want to call out particular things, this is a nice way to do it. So that's the coloring rule. Let's drag this back out. Sizing is a different idea. Sizing will change the, as it says, the size of the points based on something that you provide. Now you can do it with a categorical variable. I don't particularly recommend it because this sort of violates our idea of what uh, size differences are. Size is a nice scalar sort of operation. Bigger is bigger in our minds than smaller. And so they're transitive and they make sense along a scale. So if you do something categorical, size differently, it's really not going to convey the right sort of meanings. So let's pick again something like domestic gross, something that's actually continuous. And so if we drag it over to size, now we can sort of see where those points are. And what's valuable about this, as you'll notice, is sometimes we'll be able to spot patterns. Our brains are very good at this, uh, especially with something like size, where maybe all the higher... Uh, or larger size dots occur at one part of the dimension. So we do get bigger ones in the higher scores. You know, you p potentially think that better rated movies, whether it be from an audience or Rotten Tomatoes, would tend to have higher gross. But there are some notable outliers. So things that gross really well, 
There's The Hangover Part 2, not particularly well-reviewed by the Rotten Tomato. Uh, or Twilight Breaking Dawn, not particularly well-reviewed by Rotten Tomatoes, but pretty high in audience. These grossed very highly, even though they weren't highly rated. So we can see things that are exceptions to what are otherwise uh, pretty coherent relationships. And so that's the sizing role. Now there's a special role, if I drag this out, uh, that we can't really do with these data. It's the map shape. And so I'm going to just move this around for a second. I'm going to go to my data links and grab a different data set. Let's do U.S. demographics. Because this special role requires that our data set has some sort of variable that indexes location. In this case, we have the different states, so an actual variable named with states. Now that map shape role allows you to drag something like, like state, Oops, let me not select, but let me drag. And if you drag it into the map shape section, you get a canvas of the United States, in this case, because we're using states. And what I can do is now color these by some other variable. Let's say uh, smokers. I could just drag smokers right into the center. Now, you may have noticed on the right-hand side, the smokers uh, variables being sort of ported over to the color role because what we're making is essentially a heat map. So we're heat mapping the states on the basis of that variable or the levels of that variable. And so we get to see geographic relationships this way. Uh, we'll talk a little bit more about maps later. There are times when they're very effective and very useful, especially when the story in your data is about geographic locations. Uh, graphs can also be sort of distorted by using uh, heat maps on a, on a map. Um, it's actually very difficult for us perceptually to make comparisons on, on just color alone. So we have to do this with some care and some caution. Uh, but certainly maps are useful when you really do have a geographic story in your data. All right, so that's the map shape role. And so this is the basic drop zones. Again, we have drop zones for data. So those are the Y and the X. So that's the basic data drop zones. We have the splitting and trellising drop zones, group X, wrapping, and group Y. We have the overlay drop zone, which is really about creating the same graph in the same space, but overlaying. And then we have drop zones for coloring and size of points. And then we have the special drop zone for map shape. Now you may have noticed I missed a couple. There's page and frequency. These are special use drop zones when your data is pre-summarized and you would like to uh, kind of restore them back to the frequencies you observe. You can place a frequency or weighting variable here. And paging is sort of an idea of creating the exact same graph, uh, but not wrapped, not trellised, but really about creating the same graph over and over. So uh, if I drag, let's just do theater opening by domestic gross. And let's say we want to make this as a separate plot for all the different themes. So I can drag theme over to page and suddenly now I actually get several graphs all separated out. So not trellis, not wrapped, uh, but actually completely separately. And so that's the page operation. All right, so that's the, the basics of the drop zones. Now I want to show you something about showing and hiding controls because if we're creating a graph, and I'll just go back and create something simple. Uh, so I'll do, let's actually use our Hollywood movies since we were working most with that. Uh, let's drag the Rotten Tomato and audience again. I can grab them both and drag them in. Let's say we're happy with this graph and we want to copy and paste it or send it out to somebody. We probably don't want to include all the controls and the panels and showing these roles. So when you click the done button, jump will hide all of those sections and now you're left with more or less the finished graph. We can change things if we want. We can click on the title. We can you know, change off the smooth line. We can change the, the axes. But effectively, we've removed the controls, the, op uh, the options and the operations that will let us change the graph. So if you want to get the graph back, use the red triangle. And if you're new to jump, click every red triangle. These are little uh, context menus that will give you options. And notice you can turn back on the control panel. So just because you removed it doesn't mean you can't get it back. And so you can do this operation as many times as you want. Show and hide the control panel. All right, so with that, let's talk about the graph types that we can create. And this little ribbon across the top, our palette, is really what we're working with. And you may have noticed that we can click on and off different visuals. We can select different ones, so I can click over to uh, a line of fit. We can click over to an ellipse. These are all different things we can do. The way the palette works is if we click off something, it's removed. If we click on, it's added. Sometimes, and you'll notice when I click between things like the line of fit, and the ellipse, we're not putting all of them on the same plot. Uh, the reason why is Jump's making sort of a guess that if you want the line of fit, you probably don't also want that density ellipse. If you wish to add it and not remove the line, you can drag it on top of the graph. And so now you can actually add multiple graph elements to the same graph. 
Another way you can do this, let me click it off, is if I hold down the shift key and click on a visual in the palette, it'll also add it. So in Jump's mind, if you're holding the shift key, it says add to the graph this new element, but without removing another one. And so notice that we can sort of multi-plot that way. And so this is the graph type. So let's look at some basic examples. We've been looking at continuous by continuous data, and this is really the domain of scatter plots. Uh, now scatter plots are great when you have continuous by continuous data. They certainly uh, uh, take advantage of really strong uh, pre-attentive and sensory processing that does well with position. So if we're just looking at the points, let me turn off everything, we're very good at resolving where points are in space. And I'll show you about turning on grid lines if that's something you want once we get to graph customizations. All right, so that's continuous by continuous. Let's look at plotting continuous variables by categorical variables. And notice that if we start over here, I'll drag theme, which is a categorical variable, to my x-axis. The first thing we get are these sort of unaligned dot plots. What this is really showing us is the number of different movies in these different themes. But as soon as we specify a y variable, these points will become aligned and have a y dimension. So let's look at themes on the basis of or predicting something like audience score. Once we've done this, we now have different graph options along the top. Now, column and bar charts are probably the most typical ones you'll see with these type of data. So if I click on the bars, we now get sort of the bar chart showing us the audience score averages. And the average is what's shown. And we'll talk about this when we look at sort of customizing and working with graph controls. Uh, but we can decide what summary statistics we want to show. You know, maybe the mean isn't what we want, but we want the median. And so we can sort of change this however we want. Now, column charts, which is really what this is, uh, and bar charts, which would be if we flipped these variables, show really the same thing. And just a nice trick in Graph Builder, if we want to change out theme and put it on instead the y-axis and audience score on the x, we can right-click any of those variables, swap it with another. So I'm going to swap audience score with theme. And now we have what would be typically called a bar chart. So bar charts are with the categories on the y-axis and column charts, the categories on the x. Now, just a best practice here, if you have a lot of different categories, putting your categories along the y-axis actually leads to a better plot. And this is simply because we can read from left to right, and we don't have to rotate or deal with sort of uh, unruly axis labels. So let me show you what I mean. Let me swap it back. So these are slightly turned, which is not bad. I think we can all read without turning our heads too much. But imagine if we had hundreds of more variables, this just gets a little bit cramped. And so my preference is to have the, the sort of larger number of categories on the y-axis. Now, those are column and bar charts. And when we talk about customizations later, we'll talk about air bars. This is always something, especially when showing scientific data, you want to communicate the air around your observation. Um, but another way of talking about these or showing the sort of the variables uh, is the box plot. And I, I'm a big fan of box plots. Now, certainly they're not showing the same type of data. So the center of each box plot is the median and we have the quartiles, and then we have the fences. And box plots are great because it shows at once really the center of the data, but also a little bit about the distribution of the data. And let me show you what I mean. If I pull up in a separate graph builder, let's create sort of the same plot. I'll do theme, I'll do audience score, I'll turn on the columns or the bars. When we're just looking at a measure of center, like we are with the, the box or, or sorry, with the bar or column chart, uh, we're just seeing one point about the data. Really, the, the height or length of this bar shows just one piece of information. The box plot shows more than that, right? We get a sense of how variable the scores are from the audience within any theme. And so this ends up being a very nice way of communicating information about the data. Uh, again, we're showing the median, not the mean, uh, but it does show us some, some considerable additional information that most people find valuable. Now there's one other visual here that I haven't uh, talked about yet, which is this contour. And so these are little violin plots. And so the violins are interesting too, because just like the uh, box plot, they're showing something about the distribution of data. Now with this many categories, it gets a little bit messy. And I'll come back to showing you the, uh, the contour plot later with some smaller data. But that's another way to actually show sort of the range and also the distribution of the data. All right, so let me go back to the box plots there. So that's when we have continuous by categorical. And notice that I don't have categorical by continuous. It's really, as far as jumps concerned, the same types of graphics can be made regardless of whether you put your categories on the y-axis or the x-axis. The same sorts of things are available. 
Now notice the jump is okay with us doing other things with these data. I can click on the points. If I just wanted to see the points in each of these, that really shows the distribution of data within each, right? Because we can see where all the points are. Um, we can turn on a line. This doesn't really tell us much very interesting, uh, certainly because there's nothing about theme that is continuous or on a scale. And so the idea of connecting points between the different themes doesn't really make sense statistically, but we can do it in certain cases. Maybe that makes sense for your data. Uh, I'll click through some of these other ones. Some won't make total sense. So the histogram, and this we'll come back to later when we talk about some special graphics, this really shows the distribution. These are little histograms for each of the themes. We can do heat maps, really kind of an interesting way of showing the distribution of data. Again, I'll, I'll caution you about heat maps there, uh, albeit kind of pretty. Um, they are sometimes hard to extract the original data from. So with counts from zero to six, that's not terribly hard to know where is high and where is low. Uh, but sometimes when you have very large scales and you really want to make minute or fine differences or distinctions between things, that gets a little bit tricky. And then some of these other plots really won't make sense. If I turn on a pie chart, uh, which is pretty horrible here, it's just simply showing me the count uh, within each of these. Some of these don't make sense, tree maps or mosaic plots. And so you can plot many different things, but there often will be a sensible plot from your data and some that don't really make a lot of sense. All right, so that is continuous by categorical. Now let's look at some categorical by categorical because this is where those mosaic plots and heat maps actually do make a lot of sense. And so let me close out this one. I'll open myself just a new graph builder. Let's say we're interested in, um, actually let's pop over to a different data set that, that's probably a little more amenable for this one. I'm gonna pull up in San Francisco Crime. This is a really fun data set that, that comes with Jump. Uh, this is from a couple week period in San Francisco. Uh, all the different crimes that actually happened in, in San Francisco. And so we have some geographic data and so we'll see this for some mapping later on. Uh, but this is a nice way to look at um, sort of categorical against categorical data. So I'll go to Graph Builder again. And let's say we're interested in understanding how the different regions experience crime by different days of the week. So region here, police district, is a categorical variable. I'll drag that to the Y. The first thing Jump does is just show us the count here of observations. So how many observations or how many crimes were committed in the different regions. So we can see the southern is the highest. But let's say we want to look at that as a function of day of week. And so I'm going to drag day of week to the X. Now, Jump really had to decide, what are you trying to show? So it's going to show us the counts for day of week. But notice we have active some things up here, like the heat map. And I'm going to click on the heat map because this is a real interesting view and one that I, I, I quite like. And so we're looking at from Sunday through Saturday, so the different days of the week, where the most crime is occurring across, really broken up apart, the different police districts. And so this gives us, obviously, a neat view. Currently, the southern region is most active, right? Uh, but we can see across the different regions where there are sort of hot spots of crime. And so the mission on Sunday and maybe on Friday seems like there's some issues. Um, and then some places where there's very low crime relative to the rest of the day. So in park on Tuesdays or on Thursdays. Now, of course, if we get more data, these patterns may not persist across time. But uh, it is a nice way to visualize really quickly. Let me show you another way you can do this. So I, this is one I really like. I'm going to do time of day, and we just get one big box plot to start. I'm going to drag day of week. Now we get box plots showing for the different times by day of week. But let's click over to the heat map again, because Jump, remember, will create heat maps even if you have continuous variables. What it will do is pick the bin widths, and what we end up here, which I think is kind of neat, is for different three-hour bins across different days of week, sort of the average crime. And so we're looking at the counts here. And so looking at this, where if we are, I guess, trying to not, uh, not have something happen to us, or if we're trying to avoid crime, you're going to look for the places of the coldest, so the bluest. And so you can see between 3 and 6 a.m., pretty much across any district, uh, there's very little crime reported. And I guess that makes sense. There's very few people out in San Francisco between 3 and 6 a.m. Uh, but this gives you a nice way of looking at those data in a in kind of a quick way. And again, taking advantage of the fact that uh, we pick out patterns very well. So we can see, you know, again, Fridays tend to have little, a little crime heat here. And uh, Mondays between 3 and 6, uh, 3 and 9 actually, quite interestingly. Now, with all of these, and sort of as uh, we saw with the drop zones, we can use the other roles to do additional things, even with categorical by categorical. So the wrapping is a nice one to use here. Uh, so if we pull back in police district, 
I'm going to wrap by police district now. Now we can get those heat maps really separated out by district. And this is sort of, sort of a nice view. Uh, it's a way of looking at a lot of dimensions of the data at once. We can pick out the hot spots. Those kind of pop out for us pretty obviously. Uh, we can see the places where there's very little crime and places where even none were reported. So the missing cells uh, shows places there just was no crime. Remember, we can always click done when we're done with the visual and that'll hide the, uh, the control panel so we can save it for later. All right, so that was heat maps. Let's take a look at a mosaic plot. And to look at this, I'm going to pull open a, kind of a simpler data set. Let's do the consumer preferences. And so these are, are really just a data set of, of many different questions. How many years somebody's been at their employer, their employee tenure, uh, whether they're single or not, their birth year. So a lot of categorical data. So I'm going to go back to Graph Builder. And let's try uh, this one. This is going to be the mosaic plot option. And let's say we're interested in how people are, are single or not, depending on their age group, uh, presuming that maybe people tend to pair up or become married as they get older. And so if we just drag both categorical variables in here, notice age is not continuous. We're grouping age by age group here. That's actually a variable that's ordinal. And let's click on the mosaic plot. And the mosaic plot's a really neat way of capturing uh, information about the data. And so let's just look at the width on the x-axis of the different sections. So the width is actually telling us how frequent the different age groups are. So if we were just looking at the width on the x-axis of the different columns, we can see that the 25 to 29 year old range is the most represented. We have the most people in our data set of that age. Now, if we look at the y-axis, what we're looking at are the single and not single people as different sections of these different columns. And what we can see internally then is the proportionality of single versus not single for the different age groups. And so 29 to 25 basically kind of split, uh, but as we get older or as the age groups here are older, uh, we have more people who are reporting that they were not single. And so the mosaic plot is a really nice way of capturing that sort of categorical distinction. And of course, just like all our other graphs here, we can use the other roles if we like. And so if we break this up by, let's say, gender, and so I'm going to drag gender over here as a wrap, uh, we can see this separated out for males and females. Presumably, we would think they would show the similarish pattern, although we have um, selection here, so they probably are different people, obviously, and not all the married couples. Uh, so creating these roles, really useful, especially remember that you can use the different uh, trellising and splitting options with really any visual you create. And when you're done, make sure you hit done. All right, so that's our categorical by categorical. Now, involving multiple variables, we've already seen how to involve variables in the sort of the side by side or the splitting rather, uh, and the trellising roles. Uh, but let's look at uh, involving overlays, multiple Y's and X's, and some side by side data. And so I'm going to go back to my original Hollywood movies data set. And so if I have it here, I can actually click on it again. There's my Hollywood movies. Let's look at overlaying again, because there's some sort of useful things we can do with overlay uh, that we haven't quite talked about yet. And so let's uh, start with the visual where we have something categorical predicting something continuous. So I'll do uh, theme and let's do audience score. And I'm going to click on the bars here. Now, Genre is another variable that, that may or, you know, it's probably not distributed evenly over theme, but let's try putting that into my overlay. And you'll notice what will happen when we have uh, missing categories here. And so the overlay is trying to, within each of the different sections, sort of plot the different uh, film types. And so this is an instance where uh, you won't really get a graph that's as useful as if you were to use uh, your genre in other sections. So I, I really like when you have missing categories uh, showing it in a wrap. And so notice what happens here is you get a very quick sense of, uh, well, there's very, you know, there's no action movies uh, or the themes here, nothing really showing up in adventure. We just didn't really observe any of those. And fantasy, only certain categories pop out. So rivalry as a theme, and uh, I guess this one is trepidation as a theme. So hold on to this for a second. Let's try going back to consumer preferences. And I'll go back and launch a graph builder here. So let's try a situation where we do have fully crossed. So I'll do, uh, let's do age group. And let's do something like salary. And let's get bars there. And this time, let's use something like gender. And so I'll drag gender to my overlay. 
and notice that when we have full data or data available, then we get the side-by-side -side bars that we might expect. And so what we're getting here is really our, our double or side-by-side -side plots. Now, I want to caution you, when you choose which variable to have as your overlay and which to have as your x, you need to make sure that you are drawing the correct comparison. Notice that we have a very easy comparison within each age group uh, between males and females. It's very obvious for us to make that comparison simply because they're right next to each other. The less obvious comparison is how females and males' salaries are changing across the lifespan. With this number of categories, with two, it's actually pretty easy. We can just ignore the blue bars and sort of follow the path of the red, or ignore the red bars and follow the path of the blue. But as we get to more categories, that's certainly going to be a little more tricky. Now, here's a tip I have. So if I right click, remember we can swap variables. Let's swap our gender here with age group. And notice now that our comparison becomes a little more direct between sort of males and females across the lifespan because they're effectively pushed next to each other in the graph. And so the comparison is easy perceptually. And so just one thing to consider when you're using overlay, uh, try it a couple ways and see what will really convey the meaning you really want to convey. And so that's one thing with overlay. Now I'll make a point under overlay. I'll actually go back and let's swap uh, gender and salary again so we have it like this. Under the control panel, and we'll come back to this when we talk about uh, graph controls, there's different ways you can work with overlay, especially with bars. And so stacked bar charts, if we want to stack on top of each other, the males and females, um, be careful with stacked bar charts. They're neat, and I think they convey parsimoniously uh, aspects of the data, and certainly we can look at the, the total sort of average for each of these. Um, but the components of the, the stack end up being a little bit hard to discern occasionally, uh, especially when we have more than two categories. So for instance, let me put position tenure instead of uh, gender here as my overlay. The internal components, since they're offset from each other, don't get as easily compared. And so uh, if you're asked about how the five to 20 years or five to 10 years group is changing, we can sort of do it if you just kind of remap each time going across. Um, but it's a lot harder than if these were simply side by side. And so side by side, the comparison becomes, of course, a little more obvious. And so be careful with changing that to the stack. Now, some of these other ones, bullets, uh, putting one inside another, uh, nesting, you can play around with these a bit. Um, we'll talk about these more in a more advanced webinar, but they uh, they do give you options for, for displaying in certain ways. But side by side is the default for, for good reasons. All right, so that's using overlay. Uh, multiple Ys and multiple Xs is a useful thing to know, and it, and it involves a drop zone that isn't totally obvious at first, uh, but is one you're going to want to know about. And so let me drag something like age group into my X. I'll do, let's say, salary again on the Y, and I'll turn on some bars. Uh, let's say you want to show salary differences not just across age group, but also single status. So something that uh, is additional you want to plot along the x-axis. Now, it's not entirely obvious, but if you look just to the right of age group, there's a little blue drop zone here. And if I drop here, I actually get a plot with not just age group, but also single status with the same y variable. And so I'm showing on the same graph, really right next to each other, uh, another visual that look, really relies on the same y-axis. And we can do this for as many variables as we want. And so I could take school-age children. Notice there's that little drop zone to the right here. Let me not drop it there. Let me actually say I want to put it between the two. So I'm going to drop it inside there. And so I can sort of put it into one section. And so that's how we can actually have multiple uh, x variables predicting the same y. Now we can do the same thing with the Y. So let's say we don't just want to see how age group relates to salary, but maybe we want to see how age group uh, relates to the year in current position. And so same thing on the Y axis, there's another section here, and I can drop that variable in. And notice now we're actually showing uh, not just salary, but also years in current position. Now we can stagger these two. So let's take single status. And let's do the same thing we did on the x-axis, drag to the right. And notice now we have four different plots, all showing something different, uh, but all shown in the same graph. And so this is a nice way to make sort of a multi-visual when you really want to uh, sort of add additional variables to explain something. And so that's an interesting way to do that. Now, uh, that's really the side-by-side -side graphs, the multiple y's and x's. Let me show you this in a different plot. And so let me go to Hollywood movies again. <laughs> 
Let me go to my graph builder. And let's say we wanted to show how uh, domestic gross predicted audience score and Rotten Tomatoes score. And so you already saw that I can take audience score and I could take something like Rotten Tomatoes score and drag it above. So those are now on separate plots. But there's another drop zone you may not know is there until you've seen it, which is this interior one. If I drop it right here, these get plotted on the same plot internally, almost like we overlaid them. So remember with overlay, if we had a variable that said what type of rating was it, was it Rotten Tomatoes or audience, like if we had something categorical, we could have used it in the overlay role. But in this case, we can simply drag them into the graph to add them here. Now, this works because audience score and Rotten Tomato score is on the same scale, right? They're from 0 to 100, and so it becomes pretty trivial to have them plotted the same. Just be aware if you drag in something like, let's say, world gross, which is a much larger number, watch what happens here. So it will plot them for you. They're on the same graph, but notice that it doesn't quite work because world gross is on such a bigger scale uh, that they don't really get plotted very well. Now, I want to show you a trick. This isn't something I typically recommend because what you're going to end up with is a visual that's a little complicated and probably not the best for what you want to display. But you can actually double plot in Jump. So if you right click this axis, go move to the right and pick which variable you want to push to another axis. So for instance, world gross isn't on the same scale as audience score and Rotten Tomato score. So if I select world gross and push it to the right, we actually have a double plotted scale. And so two of my variables are on the zero to 100 scale. And one of my variables is on, in this case, a zero to 1400 scale. And so we can have a visual like this, and maybe something like this will tell a story that's meaningful for you, uh, but be aware it's sort of a complicated graph to read, and double plotting can occasionally really contort the meaning in your data, and so uh, be a little bit weary of that. All right, so that's multiple Ys and multiple Xs, and the same thing applies for the X. There's a drop zone internally, so we can add variables to it. All right. So that's additional variables. Uh, multiple graphs, this is something uh, about adding additional graph elements to your data set. And so uh, let's do something simple and I'll show you a graph that I, I quite like. Um, so I mentioned before, I, I quite like box plots. And so if I do genre and let's do, um, let's do a big number, so like domestic gross. So box plots do a really nice job conveying uh, the scale of the data. Whereas a bar chart is really good because you can convey the mean really simply. Um, so here's a cool graph. So I'm going to click on the contours. And remember contour, uh, as I showed you before, it's basically like a little folded distribution showing the scale or the really the uh, range of the data. Actually, if I click on the points, you'll see what I mean. So I'm going to click on the points and I'm going to hold down shift actually to click on the points so I can add the points to the visual. Remember, I can do that either by clicking with shift or dragging them in. So with the points, you can kind of see what the contour is doing. When we have just two points, we get this straight contour up and down. That's the extent of the data. When we have a lot of points clustered down at the bottom, we get a sort of a fat distribution or a fat contour. So we're showing not just the range of the data, but we're also showing the distribution in kind of a neat way. But here's something I like to do, and this, this speaks to the multiple graphs, and actually something we're going to get to in a second with graph controls. So I have the points turned on here, and notice in the control panel for the points, uh, the summary is shown as none, which means it's showing the actual observations, right? Each one of these is an actual observation in the data set. I'm going to have the points be summarized in a way. I'm going to tell it to calculate the mean for each of the points or for each of the sections. So now we get a single point that's actually the mean or the center, just like what the bar would be. If I click and hit shift on the bar, and notice the bar height goes exactly to the point because that's where the mean is. But I can add something like an error bar to my points. And so we'll talk about error bars a little bit too uh, later on. But I have jump just calculate the standard error for me. And so now I get a measure of center, the mean. I get a measure of error, with which that mean is estimated, plus I get a representation of the distribution of the data. And that's what the contour conveys for us. And so that gives us a lot of information really quickly about the data and something that maybe a box plot uh, wouldn't do as well. And box plots are great, but I think the contours are even more rich with uh, how they convey the data. All right, so let's minimize that one. Okay, let's look at some special graphs. So we're looking at sort of the basic ones so far, uh, but geographic mapping is a really useful thing we can do in Jump. I showed you that quickly with the US demographics data set. And so again, 
If you have any data set that has something that represents geography like state, we can simply drag it to the map shape and drag in a variable to color the states by. And so that's a really nice way to do that. Now, we can also create graphs geographically using latitude and longitude. So remember with San Francisco crime, this data set? To the right-hand side, we actually have a latitude and longitude section. And so watch what happens here. Let me go to Graph Builder. I'll just grab them both and drag them in. It may not be totally obvious, but these points are sort of forming the outline of San Francisco. And since Jump interprets these as numbers, it's actually adding a smoother. Let me click off the smoother. Now, to get a map, right-click the graph. Go to the graph submenu, and notice there's a sec section for background map. There's actually a number of different maps you can get. Uh, these are on the right hand side the shapes that jump accepts natively. But let's look at the left hand side. We can do something like a simple earth or a detailed earth. These are really images. The NASA server will pull, pull down satellites. The street map service is what I want. If I click on street map service, uh, jump's actually going to phone out to open street maps, and it'll pull down street level details uh, for San Francisco. And if I go to my tools menu, and there's a little magnifier, this becomes pretty useful. Let's just zoom into a section. And notice what Jump will do is it'll re-render the graph, so we actually can get down to really street-level information here. And this is a great way, especially when there's something about the geography uh, that's important. And notice that we can, again, just like we did before, trellis our graph. So I'm going to trellis by police district here. And this is kind of a neat thing to do. So you can see the different districts, where they are, and sort of the density of points. And so this is something I quite like when you're communicating something that's really valuable geographically. All right, so that's graphing with latitude and longitude. Uh, there's a special graph now in graph uh, jump 13. You could always have made this before by going directly to the parallel plot, but this is something now that's in graph builder. It's called a parallel plot, and this is great for high dimensional data. And what I mean by high dimensional data is when you have, just like we do with US, US demographics, a number of different variables you know, that represent things about these states. And you want to show them sort of all at once, because let's say your question is, which states are most similar to which other states along these dimensions? Now, that's a tricky thing to do normally, but here's a great way to do it. Take all the variables at once, drag them into X. It's going to look weird at first, because what it's trying to do, remember, is plot all those variables on the same scale. But as soon as you click over here, this is the parallel plot what you actually get is something really neat. And I want to take a second to break it down because it's, um, if you haven't seen a parallel plot before, it's a little mysterious. But as soon as you know what it's doing, it's pretty obvious. Each one of these traces is a state. And so I'm going to click on the one with a huge population. And the way I know it's a huge population, so if I hover over this one, you'll see it's eventually California. It's a huge population because the population column or the population point on this x-axis, it's really high on that. And so what we're looking at for each variable is really a standardized or a scaled version of each. And so vegetable consumption, you know, even these are on different scales, like it's showing you the endpoints for each of them. Even though they're on different scales, we can look at traces of states um, in a kind of a simple way. So if I click on any of these, that's actually a particular state. And, and remember in Jump, everything is connected. So if I just you know click anything in my data set, that's Utah there. And so we can see the profile of Utah. And so if our question was, which states are most similar to which other states? Well, it's the states that kind of share a similar profile. And so I can select a couple of these that just had similar physical activity. And suddenly we can sort of get an idea of Washington, Utah, and uh, Oregon sort of all share a similar trace. And so parallel plots are a really neat way of actually um, looking at a lot of dimensions of data all at once. And so that's something I recommend you, you check out. All right, so in multiple distribution plots, this is something we actually saw before when we clicked around creating a visual. And so we did this with actually Hollywood movies. And this is actually really useful, again, when your main interest is showing the distribution of a variable. And I want to show you what this looks like. I'll just grab in something like domestic gross. And if we click on the histogram, so the histogram which we can get from the distribution platform, right? this actually shows us the distribution, literally where the points are. So most of the, the domestic grosses are pretty low, 0 to 50, uh, thousand I suppose, 50 million, um, and then some that are really high. But utilizing that group for Y section, I'll drag something like genre over there. Now we actually get this graph where we're looking at across the different genres, the different sort of histograms for each. And there's a handy trick, if you haven't noticed it in distribution, if you go to the graver and you click and drag up on any histogram, it'll actually change the bin widths. 
And so we can actually make these bins a little bit smaller to show a little bit more about the distribution of the data. And so there are times this is actually a very useful visualization. Um, I'll give you one example. So I spent some time writing Apple Script to uh, pull for the last six years all 38,200 uh, of my sent emails because I was really interested in seeing uh, when I'm typically sending emails. And so this is kind of a fun one. I'll put in something like hour on the x-axis and let's look at day of week as my group for x. And now I actually have a profile of when I'm sending email. So you see it's you know before 7 a.m. It's pretty rare for me, 6 a.m., some emails. Um, but really the high time for me is Monday looks like around noon. Uh, so if you, or I guess Tuesday around 11. So if you really want to get a response from me, that's probably when it's going to be. Um, but multiple distribution plots give us an easy way to see this. And you could do it as bars, of course. We could do it as line traces. Uh, there's certainly lots of ways you can, you can create these, these little multiple distributions. But again, showing a lot of, of dimension of the data because you get a real sense of where the observations are. All right, so that's some special graph types. Now, I want to show you something about graph controls because we already talked about changing statistics, but there's times when you can limit variables that are used for each visual. And to talk about this one, I want to tell you about um, something that's, that's especially valuable if you're working with scientific publications, which is custom error bars. And so I'm just going to hide some of these to clean up my, my decks here. Um, the value of custom error bars especially when you're working with maybe simulation data or something where you're not computing just a basic standard error, uh, it's really important to be able to create these. And, and I showed you making regular error bars. Let's uh, just do it quickly so you can remind yourself. Uh, let's just say we're looking at genre by world gross and we have bars. Now the error bar section here gives you some options. You could do the range as an error bar. You can do the standard error. So calculated just sigma divided by the square root of n. Uh, standard deviation error bars, really just showing your estimate of sigma, or a confidence interval, and showing confidence interval. So your standard error set to whatever alpha level you have under the red triangle. So those are the error bars you can do by default, but occasionally you're going to have a custom error bar, something you really want to plot specifically. And so I have a little toy data set here where suppose I calculated uh, salary levels here, and I have the mean for those different salaries. Uh, so for different age groups, but let's say I have for some reason a custom standard error that I need to calculate and if I go into graph builder, it's not entirely obvious at the start if I put the mean Level here and I put on the bars. It's not entirely obvious how I can get this plus or minus a custom standard error So I want to show you how to do it and it's going to involve the graph controls by delimiting or limiting certain variable scopes and let me show you a nice trick way of doing this. And so what we're going to be calculating is really the upper and lower bound around the mean. We're going to manually create where the error bar extent should be. And we're going to do this with a great thing in jump using instant formulas. And so this is a nice way of creating a new variable. In the data set, grab two variables. I'm going to right click. I'm going to do a new formula column. I'm going to combine the two variables I have by taking a sum. And so that's going to create the mean plus this custom standard error. So that's the upper limit of that first one. I'm going to click again, new formula column, combine, take a difference. So it's going to subtract. So now 50,000 minus 30,000, that's the lower limit of the error bar. So I have two new variables that are actually going to make up the upper and lower bounds of the error. So we're going to do really combining a couple things that we learned how to do today. I'm going to take these two variables. I want to plot them in addition to the mean. So remember there's that drop zone on the inside. You can drop it here and it adds the two. So right now what Jump's doing is it says, okay, well you want to plot all three variables as bars. But that's not exactly what we want to do. Under the bar controls, I can tell Jump, okay, for this first bar, the first bar I really want to just be the mean, don't plot those other two. So keep it as just the mean. But here's the trick. I'm going to grab the bar and drag in another bar. So I'm going to keep plotting more bars. But for the second bar, I'm going to tell it, don't worry about the mean. We've already plotted that once. This new bar, I want you to do something special with. Instead of a side-by-side -side bar, I want you to plot for me uh, an interval. And the interval uses that upper bracket to lower bracket just like an error bar and what it's literally plotting is just those two and the interval between them on top of the existing mean bar. And so what we've just created is the custom error bar. So for each of these we have the interval step 
around the center, so around the mean shown for each salary level, so for each uh, sorry level of uh, age group, showing the mean salary plus that special error. And so that utilizes these special controls. And the real trick is that you can tell for each visual you apply, uh, you can tell jump what variables you want it to consider when actually creating that bar or creating whatever uh, different palette option you've selected. And so custom error bars are, are, once you've done it a couple times, rather quick. And it's a nice, efficient way of doing it uh, for really any type of custom error you have. All right, so those are some tips there. Now, graph customizations, uh, for any of the graphs we have, let me just pull open one of these and let's talk about it. Actually, that's a bad one because it's a special type of graph. Let's do a simple one that we had. There we go. So changing axis scales. So if you double click on any of the axes, you get an axis control panel. Uh, certainly look through here. There's lots of options, things like turning on grid lines. So I can turn on the grid lines for my y-axis. I can plot it in a different type of scale. So changing the type from linear to log, let's say. And so maybe that's a better way of displaying the data for us. Right? So we can change a lot of things about the, the axes, including fonts, including the label orientations, how we do tick marks, and the number of increments. That's all a part of the axis scaling. Now, reference lines and areas. This turns out to be a really useful thing to do. Potentially, maybe $100 million is a special point on a graph here. Maybe a world gross above $100 million is especially useful. And so if we look under the reference lines, I can put a value in. Let's do $100 million. Actually, let's change our scale back to linear so we can know exactly where that's going to be. So 100 is my scale point. I'm going to click Add and hit OK. And notice now Jump puts that line right at 100. We can also do ranges. Potentially, there's something important about... Uh, I'll click range here, uh, 100 to 200 million. And I want that to be labeled something like um, almost best selling or almost there. Something about, you know, where we are. I'll click add. It's going to add this. I had a, a particular gradient selected. And so now it's going to add that as a reference area. And so we can embellish our graphs with these different reference lines, especially when they're meaningful, you know, exceeding some limit. Uh, there are times when you simply want a reference line at zero, especially if things can go negative. It's nice to have zero marked. So actually, let me double click. I'll put a, a zero here. And for zeros, I like to change the line style to like a nice dotted line. So now we know it's not really something we're marking, uh, just that zero point. Right, so those are our reference lines and areas. Now, gradients, we talked a little bit about um, just the, the value of them for heat maps and maybe some of the, the cautions about them. Um, let's pull open a graph and, and let me show you something kind of interesting that happens occasionally. These are actually obesity and diabetes rates for U.S. counties. And so if I go to Graph Builder, we're going to utilize a couple things at once here. I'm going to take the FIPS code for the counties, put it in my map shape. I get the canvas of the counties here. Uh, let's drag on total population. Because I want you to see what happens here. There's one county, turns out to be Los Angeles County, which is so big that the scale does a really poor job of showing the distribution of population across the states or across the counties in the rest of the, uh, the country. And so this is kind of problematic. We need that scale to work in a different way. Now, one way we could have solved this problem is by maybe logging the population first, taking the log. I can right-click and transform it to be a log here. But let's actually keep the original population scale, but instead right-click the actual gradient, select gradient, and under the gradient settings, we have some options. And, and what I like to do is change the scale type. Instead of being a linear scale, let's change it to quantile scales which means that the scale will go from 0, 25, 50%, 75%, and 100%. It's literally putting it into bins for us and, and grading the scale across that range. And when I click OK, notice we get a much better sense of the geographic distribution of populations. No longer do we just see one really red one and a bunch of blue. Now, just a note about color themes. Um, you can right click and change under gradient the actual color theme. I, I mostly prefer, unless there's a natural zero in the middle, a sequential color theme. And so if we go from white to blue, it's a lot easier to, to sort of see, I think, the, um, the range here. It's a very obvious range, white being low and blue being high. Uh, so be careful with color themes. You want to make sure that you're conveying everything uh, meaningfully. All right, so that's gradient. So talk about sharing really quickly here. We can combine visuals we have into dashboards. Uh, this will be covered in other webinars, but one thing in Jump 13 is under new, new dashboard. Uh, we can actually just create with a little template here uh, based on open reports, dashboards that we want to display to people.
And so this is something you can look in more of the advanced webinars. For saving and sharing, we can export any of our graphs as files. And so if you simply go to, on the Mac, File Export, on the PC, it'll be File Save As. You can export out your graphs in lots of different formats, HTML, interactive HTML with data, or even just as images. Now there's one new thing in Jump 13, exporting for the web. If you go under the View menu, we can select Create Web Report. And this is really neat. What this will do is we can select whatever graphs we want, uh, select the location for the graphs. I'm gonna stick it on my desktop here. And what this will do is go through each of our graphs It'll give us an option to give them titles or give them whatever. Uh, I'll click Build Report, and what this is going to do is build on my desktop this little HTML package. What it's done is actually created a front page with all the graphs we just made. And if you click on any of these, it loads the HTML5 version. So these are all still interactive. And so this is a great way when you've made a bunch of graphs and you really want to share them with people, uh, a way for them to still interact with the data. And again, these are interactive HTML, so the data is contained in them, so be sure with very specialized or proprietary data, um, you're careful where to share these, but this at least gives you the ability to, to make your graphs available in an interactive way. And so really nice, especially with uh, some of the complex graphs we've made. All right, so that takes us to the end. I want to point you quickly to the resources at jump.com slash JAC. This is the Jump Academic Community. And this is where I'll post the webinar from the recording today. Uh, it'll be under recent academic webinar recordings. So you can get it there. So if you want to try anything out and watch it a little slower, uh, certainly visit us there. This is also a great place to go to watch some of our other webinars. Uh, we just had a couple of our fall series so far, but we have many upcoming. So we hope you join us for more of those.